You can turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, chapter 1. We are continuing this series. As Brendan reminded us in his prayer of an old man to a young man, or at least a dying man to a man living his life for the sake of the gospel. It's First Timothy, or sorry, Second Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 8 down to verse 14. Second Timothy 1, 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Let's pray together one more time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is powerful. And Father, it will have its effect in our hearts uh, because it doesn't return empty. And so God, as we hear your word together, would we be challenged and encouraged? Would we see Christ more clearly? Uh, would, you, would we see our calling more clearly? Uh, Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever seen this toy before? One day, my children came home from a charity shop with this toy. It's one of the worst days of my life. <laughs> so it's, you know, it, it talks to you, it tells you to bop it, it tells you to pull it, it tells you to twist it, and you have to keep going. Right? And follow the commands that it gives. And that's how you keep moving forward. And it gets getting faster and faster and faster. And so the rule in our house is this gets played in your room. It does not get played anywhere else because it's annoying. But this little toy actually reminds me of this passage that Paul has for us. Uh, in this passage, he has quite a few commands that he has given to us. And he wants us uh, to move forward in our faith. He is instructing Timothy uh, to live and to thrive in his Christian life. Uh, he wants him uh, to be ready in season and out of season. We'll see that later in chapter 4 in a few weeks' time. But he really right, wants Timothy to, to live in a pattern that he's lived. We already have seen Paul's affection for Timothy, uh, that he is his own child in the faith, his son in the faith. He loves Timothy. Uh, last week, Brendan reminded us that there are these potential weaknesses that we see in Timothy, which is why one of the reasons why Paul is writing him this letter. He's reminding him that he was not given a spirit of fear. He was given a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. And so in this passage, what Paul is doing is he's pushing Timothy away from shame. He's pushing him away from fear, and he's giving him the tools that he needs to not be ashamed and to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, as Paul says in other places in his letters. And just like Timothy needs reminders, if you're anything like me, just like Timothy needs reminders of how we can walk with Jesus without shame or fear, and reminders that we too, if we're in Christ, has been, have been given a spirit of power, 
and of love and of self-control. We need those reminders because we forget the supernatural boldness that has been given to us. We're forgetful people. And we want to set our minds on the things of God, as Aaron reminded us in the reading. I want you to live out your faith with dignity, with boldness, and with conviction. And I want to do the same. And so, in this passage, I just want to show you four commands. Four commands in this passage that you have, by the Spirit of God, the power to obey. Four commands. It's like bop it, pull it, twist it. (laughs) But far more important than those commands, and hopefully not nearly as annoying (laughs) as those commands. So the first one that we see in this passage is Paul wants Timothy, and so therefore wants us, by the Spirit, being, we are being called to own the gospel. Uh, look down, verse 8, first word, therefore. Right? So it's, it's because we have power. We have this power, so therefore, he says, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. You have power, don't be ashamed. A testimony testifies. It bears witness to something. That is what we are as Christians. We are bearing witness to something. It's about what Jesus has said and done. And that should not bring us shame. It should bring us awe. The story and life of Jesus should bring us awe. And it should bring us power. The God-man, the second person of the Trinity, because of his love for us, became a man, lived a perfect life, died the death that we deserve, was raised to life, conquering death, and when we place our faith in him, our sins are forgiven, and we get his righteousness. Why would we be ashamed of that? We should stand in awe of that. Instead, in fact, we should feel dignity because of that. Sometimes you can think the opposite of shame is dignity. And what the gospel actually gives you this morning is it gives you dignity because it makes you whole. It makes you what you were always meant to be. And so the gospel brings dignity to us. It also makes us brazen. It, 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 it gives us this fullness because we are approved by the God of heaven. He has our approval. There is nothing more that you can do to gain his approval because his approval has been gained by Jesus. So you have dignity. You can be brazen and you can say with confidence, he's mine. That's my Jesus. The other thing that Paul does in this passage in verse 8, he encourages Timothy, to not be ashamed about the testimony of our Lord, but, or, and then he says, nor of me, his prisoner. So he's admonishing Timothy here to not be ashamed of him. It seems, and we'll see this more next week, it seems that Paul was an embarrassment to the family. Do you have those people in your family that you might classify as the embarrassment? Maybe you are that person. Maybe you are the embarrassment to your family. I mean, you, you look at this, and it's like Paul, like really, like all those beatings, all those imprisonments, and now this death sentence. You are such a loser. I mean, what is your problem? I mean, that's kind of what you get, and we'll see that much more next week. I'm not really exaggerating that. Paul was in dire straits. He was the embarrassment, it seems, to the family. And what Paul is asking Timothy is, don't be ashamed of me. He doesn't want him to be ashamed of Christ, and he doesn't want him to be ashamed of him, because he wants Timothy not just to own the gospel, but to own the people of God. That that is who you are. You are the people of God. There's a particularly strong inclination, I think, in our culture to avoid shame. 
I, I think maybe shame is a little bit of a bigger deal in Ireland than it might be in the States, in my experience. So saving face in the States isn't as much of a deal. It probably should be a bigger deal in the States, <laughs> but it's not that much of a deal, culturally, generally speaking, of saving face. Um, Gaining honor, losing shame here can be a pretty big deal, and you get why. I mean, everybody wants to lose shame and, and, and gain honor. I mean, that's, that's normal. But it also presents, culturally, it presents uh, a barrier to owning the gospel. If I want to always lose shame and gain honor in this world, the gospel's not helping me to do that. Uh, people are quick to shame you, even here. I've seen it on social media. It's a great place for shaming people on social media. Uh, I've seen it. Our, our state has a Facebook page, and people get shamed all the time for being that person with the loud dog. <laughs> that dog that just keeps on barking. You should be ashamed of yourself. Or when you, you know, are the person that are like the last to bring in your bins. The entire street, all the bins are gone, and like, you, like your bins are still out. Shame on you. Or I've seen even the deep sin of putting a nail in a tree. Like that is what people have been shamed for because they walked past and they saw a flyer nailed to a tree. So you can see in this culture that it's not hard to imagine then if those things are worth, like people take their time to shame you for those things, you can see how the gospel can be really shameful in the culture. Telling someone that they're a sinner in need of a savior, it's a little worse than having your dog bark. Admitting yourself to others that you are a sinner in need of a savior, well, sh well surely you're asking to be shamed then. Add to the fact that not only are you a sinner, but it required the death of the Son of God to rescue you from that. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Finally, then you include the fact that you can't do anything to reciprocate the gift. You can't bring a box of chocolates to him. You can't bring your flowers. You can do nothing to reciprocate the gift, and that's shameful. So it's not hard to imagine. And this doesn't just make you weird in the culture, it makes you an embarrassment to the progressive culture that we live in. Christians are an embarrassment to the culture that we live in because we hold completely different values. How, then, can you own the gospel in this culture? Well, a real simple thing that I think that we can do, and this is so simple, Give thanks for your meals. Wherever you are, in whatever setting, with whoever you are with, give thanks to God for your meals. That's one simple way to own the gospel. Own who you are. Own the family that you're in is that I recognize that I do not receive anything because of my hard work in and of itself. I receive everything because it's a gift from God. And so acknowledge that. That's one simple way <laughs> that we can own the gospel. And then another, maybe a little bit higher way that we can own the gospel is when you have a chance to speak of your faith, when you have a chance to share a bit of your testimony, when you can testify to Jesus, mention sin. Mention grace. And please, if you are a child of God, mention Jesus in your testimony. I have been, by God's grace, a child of God for 34 years, and I have heard lots of testimonies, and I have heard lots of testimonies that never mention any of those things. And you're like, well, I'm not clear on what it is that you are testifying. So let's be clear to own the message that we hold so dear that I am a sinner saved by grace, by faith in Jesus. And you might not be able to always articulate all that in a conversation, but when you have a chance to talk about your faith, mention those things just like they're normal. Because in 
the family of God, they are normal. The other thing that we can do to own the gospel is to stand with other Christians. And I know it's few and far between in your workplaces, in your schools, maybe even on your street, in your estate. But when you know that there's other Christians there and you see through a text or a conversation or some kind of event that that person is standing up for the gospel, be quick to stand up with them, whatever that looks like. Don't be an embarrassment or, or don't look on other Christians as an embarrassment. That's what Paul was feeling. Again, we'll see that much more next week. He was feeling alone. And you don't want to be that Christian who's alone standing up for the gospel when you know that you have a brother and sister right there with you and they're saying nothing. They're not coming along. They're not encouraging. They're not praying with you when you're trying to be bold and courageous. Paul says in Romans 1 that he is not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. He's not ashamed of it. It's powerful, and that word power there is the same word that we get the word dynamite from. There is inherent power in the gospel message. It is transformative, and so what I want you to do is blow people up with the gospel. <laughs> blow them up. Own it. We should own the gospel. Secondly, the command that Paul is giving is for us to bear the gospel. Look again at verse 8. But share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. One of the ways that we can own the gospel is by bearing it. We suffer, according to this verse, by the power of God. And you're like, what? I suffer by the power of God? Yes. When we walk this Christian life and we suffer for our faith, it is by the power of God that we do that. What is this power of God that allows us to suffer? Well, just keep reading. Look at verse 9. This power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. He has saved you and He has called you to a holy calling. Why? It's not because of anything that you have done. It's not because you're awesome. It's because He is awesome. You are not saved because you're great. You are saved because He is great. And you do not persevere in your faith because you are great. You persevere in your faith because He is great. Why did He save you then? If it wasn't because you're great, well, the verse says, because of His own purpose and grace, he has a purpose and grace. If you're a Christian this morning, it's because He has a purpose for you and He has grace for you. And when did that grace appear? The verse says, look at it, the, His grace be, be, before the ages began. <laughs> he gave you grace in Christ before time began. <laughs> That's amazing. Because we, we are so temporal, aren't we? We're just a here and now kind of people, and sometimes we need to take and get to that 50,000 foot view of what God is doing in this world and recognize that He has a plan and purpose, and that plan and purpose did not begin today, <laughs> and it didn't begin yesterday. It began before the ages began. It's not like when He created and Adam sinned and all this mess, and He's like, uh-oh, what am I going to do now? He had a plan and a purpose. And part of that was grace for you before time began. And so, brother and sister, you can suffer. You can suffer by the power of God because He knows you and He loves you and He has given you grace before time began. So sometimes I know we sit in suffering and it feels like it's never going to end and like, where is God in this? But He was in it before time began. He knows you. And Paul calls us to bear the gospel. You can bear it. 
by God's grace, you are known and loved and you are cross-bearers. That's what Aaron read to us from Mark 8. That is what a Christian is. A Christian is a cross-bearer. We bear a cross. It's an instrument of death because we die to ourselves every day. There is nothing that can happen to you that will take away your identity. Nothing can happen to you. Look at verse 10. We'll go back to verse 9. Which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. Jesus has abolished death and he's brought life and immortality. Listen, if you are a Christian this morning, you are immortal. Sounds like a great Marvel film, doesn't it? You're immortal. You really are. Death has no power over you. You you say to me, well, Steve, I'm going to die. Yes, you will die. But at that moment of death, You might be separated from your body, but you will be present with the Lord. And then at the end of time, when Jesus comes to make all things right, wherever your dead body is, it will be raised to life, and you will be reunited with it, and then you will be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with joy and submission forever. So it might feel in the moment when things are hard and you're suffering, like this is the worst possible thing. But when we come up to the 50,000 foot view and we remember that God has a plan and purpose and He gave you grace before the ages began and then even in the very worst possible suffering that could happen to you in your death, (laughs) you will be resurrected because Jesus has won. We're studying James on Friday night. I encourage you to come. It's been a really encouraging time. James chapter 1 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you want to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing? I certainly do. But it seems like trial is the way to that. In God's sovereign plan, part of our way to steadfastness and perfection is through suffering. I don't fully understand that, but the Bible teaches that. And Paul says to Timothy, share in suffering. And so we are to share in suffering. Philippians chapter 1 says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. It's been granted. It's been granted to you, not just to believe, but to suffer. 1 Peter 3 says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. The will of God for the life of the Christian includes suffering. And we should bear that suffering together when we can. Look around you. No, like really, look around. (laughs) Look at each other. You are not alone in this body. You have a family who is trying to own the gospel and bear the gospel together. And whether that suffering is because of the gospel, because that's a little different in Scripture when you think about suffering for the gospel and just life suffering. But either of those things, you do not have to be alone in. We are not designed for that, in fact. There are rare occurrences, I think, where people suffer by themselves because there's just no one else. (laughs) But you're never alone because you always have the Spirit of God with you. We are to own the gospel, 
We are to bear the gospel. Thirdly, as we bop our toy, we are to preach the gospel. Look down at verse 11. Well, again, I'll go back to 10. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul was suffering for a reason. This, this is a really long sentence, if you've noticed. All the way from verse 8 to the beginning of verse 12 is one really long sentence. It's one of those Paul sentences that you're like, oh my goodness, how do you break this apart? But what he's saying at the end there is that the, he, he suffers. Right? He's suffering because he's a preacher. He has appointed a preacher because of the gospel. There is good news to be proclaimed. Uh, the NIV actually translates that section in calling Paul a herald. He's, we don't really use that word that much anymore. Like That's not a kind of everyday word that you hear about. Oh, there's the heralds in town. Um, herald, right, the idea that is someone who is giving a message from the king. And he is proclaiming the message from the king. And a major focus later in chapter 4 is, 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 is Paul is going to talk uh, about preaching. Preach the word is what he's going to say. Here in verse 13, he says, follow the patterns of sound words, which is really the, the word there is follow my pattern of sound teaching. If you're following a pattern, you're doing the same thing. Paul was preaching and teaching something. And he's saying to Timothy, you preach and teach that. He wants Timothy to preach what he preaches. Listen, what you say about the gospel is more important than how you say it. It's not about style. It's about content. Uh, and I'm not talking about some robotic message that we just kind of spit out towards people. He, he says clearly that he wants Timothy to do it in the faith and in the love that are in Christ. But so often I think we don't say what needs to be said because we're so worried how it's going to come across. Are you anything like me? Nah? I'm, like, I'm just so worried how it's going to come across. But are we worried about what we actually say? instead of how it comes across. Sometimes we're too afraid to say things, I am, because I think, well, they're just not going to receive it well. I should be more concerned with what I'm actually saying than how it is said or how it's received because I can't control how it's received and neither can you. But we can say things that are true to people out of love, the love of Christ, we can do that. The point that Paul is trying to say here is follow the pattern. And for us, it's even a, a, a more old pattern. It's an old, old story. We are not saying anything new. We do not need fancy ways to say things. We need faithfulness to the gospel message that has been passed down from individual to individual and from church to church for a couple thousand years. And here we are in Passage West getting to do the same thing. And so the question that we should ask ourselves is how? What, what is the content that we're saying to people? God created. He created man. Man sinned. Christ came to redeem. And we need to respond to that. It's a simple message, but it's a really old one. This is a message that has changed the world, hasn't it? I mean, our calendar today is based on the coming of the Son of God. Whether or not people want to admit that, it is. This is 2024, because it's about 2,024 years since Jesus was born. Western democracy exists in part 
because of a Christian worldview. The reason why we have the freedom to sit here and do this right now is because there is a legacy of a Christian worldview. More importantly, though, he's changed the world because it's brought dead sinners to life. We were dead in our sins, what Paul writes to the Ephesians, but God has made us alive in Christ. You are changed, transformed in Christ. Think, just think about that person that you know that doesn't know Jesus. Maybe it's family, a friend, a neighbor. Just think for a moment what the transforming power of the gospel would do in that person's life. Just think. It changes everything. It changes the way that they think about the world. It will change the way that they interact with the rest of their family. It would first and foremost change their view of God. And it would bring glory and honor to God for that person to worship Him. And it would change their eternity their eternity. They would go from death to immortality. It's death to life. So, brother and sister, preach. I don't mean from up here. (laughs) That's not everyone's calling. But in your homes and in your workplaces and in your schools, who cares if you own the gospel if you can't preach it? Who cares if you bear the gospel if you can't preach it? Pray for each other as we do this. Pray for those who preach up here, but pray for each other who are preaching in your workplaces or in your homes to your children. And I don't mean standing up and doing this. That's not, that's not what I, like, It's following a pattern of sound teaching. Share sound teaching. Proclaim sound teaching. Paul is talking to Timothy about heralding in more or less this kind of format because he was a church leader. But the application to us is to take that and move into our lives in whatever way we can to share the truth of the gospel. Surround yourself with bold gospel preaching people. I don't know if you ever think about, like, who are my friends? Who are the people I'm closest with? It's good to get to know people who don't know Christ and need Him. But are you surrounding yourself as much as possible with bold gospel-preaching people? You don't want people around you who just tickle your ears and tell you everything's fine and tell you that you're a great person and tell you... You need people to challenge you. You need people to admonish you. Church, we need to be rebuking each other in love when we see sin. Do that for me. If you see me not showing up, ask me why. Why are you not here with God's people? If you see me engaging in obvious sin, preach to me. (laughs) Preach to me. Follow a pattern of truth. I need to hear truth. And we need to do that for each other. We need to own the gospel. We need to bear the gospel. We need to preach the gospel. Finally, we need to guard the gospel. Look at verse 14. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. We have been given something to guard. Listen, we are not charged with guarding the honor of Christ. We do not need to guard Jesus and his honor. That is, that is what Muslims do for Allah and Muhammad. They feel like they need to guard his honor. This is neither demanded nor necessary for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the creator of all things and he sustains them by the word of his power. I think he can defend his name 
himself. That is not what we're guarding. We also, when he says guard the deposit, he's not talking about like a physical scroll that he's giving to Timothy or this physical Bible that we have. This has been deposited to us. He is not talking about guarding this as if I need to like be precious with this actual book and I should never place it on the floor and I should never write in it. But that's not what Paul is saying to Timothy, I think, I mean, you should be a good steward of your Bible (laughs) because you want to be able to read it and find it and not lose it, and you don't want it to be a mess, and I think it does speak a little bit maybe to how you value it, but that's not what Paul is saying. He wants him to guard something. So what is this deposit? What is this treasure? Because that is what the word is. The, The implication there is what is the treasure that you're guarding? Well, it's the glorious truth of God's word. It's truth that we get to help guard. Have you noticed that this world hates God's truth? Have you noticed that? The gospel of Christ is hated by this world. I've talked about it already. The, The idea of being a sinner in need of a Savior is repugnant to the world. The authority of the Bible the world hates that. This, this book does not have authority over me. The exclusivity of Christ, the idea that Christ and Christ alone is the one that can save you from sin and nothing else, that is hated by this world. Indwelling sin, biblical marriage, biblical family, these things are hated by the world. We must guard these things. We must guard them. Guard these truths. Psalm 119, every single verse talks about the Word of God. In Psalm 119, it's a long chapter. (laughs) Read it sometime. Give yourself some space. Verse 37 says this, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. The truth of God's word is life and death stuff. So we should guard it like it's life and death stuff. You guard your most treasured possessions, right? Some of you are like, I don't have any treasured possessions. <laughs> well, you have a bank account. Most, most people have a bank account. We put our money into the bank because we don't want to just wad it up and put it under our mattress. We, we want to guard it. You put it in the bank. Well, how are we guarding the gospel? How are we guarding truth? How are we doing that for our own hearts, and how are we helping others to guard the truth in their hearts? Paul's handing something off to Timothy. He's on his deathbed, as it were. He knows he has a death sentence, and he's handing something off. How are we handing it off to others? It's things that we probably don't think about as nearly as much as we should. Dads, speak truth to your families. Preach. And in preaching, you're guarding truth. In some form or fashion, Regular, simple, consistent family time of Bible reading or something. And consistent could be whatever that is, but make it consistent (laughs) because your children need their hearts guarded. Be discerning about what you watch and listen to. News, movies, TikTok, music, Instagram, we are inundated with information all the time. And hear me, every single one of those things has a worldview. Do you know what a worldview is? A worldview is a particular bent on how the world is viewed. Every single thing that you consume media-wise has a worldview. And so we should be aware of that fact. And I'm not saying that we should tell each other what we should or should not watch. 
And there probably are some things that we just shouldn't watch. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. And if you're not sure, we'll talk to people about it, right? But what I am saying is just be aware. Be aware that when you sit down and you consume something that goes into your ears or into your eyes, that you are not just consuming humor or entertainment. You are consuming a worldview. And so we need to guard our hearts into what it is that we're consuming. Because it matters. There is not a neutral position for any of these things. It's not neutral. Listen, every lesson in our kids' schools has a worldview. Every lesson that my, in my kids' school, whether it be math, science, something, it has a worldview. So the government schools, government media, government programs, they want to produce something. They are producing a product, and it is not a gospel-minded, Christ-loving product. That's not their goal. So just be aware of that. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have your kids there, or you shouldn't listen to that, or you shouldn't do, be a part of this program, or whatever it is. It, 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 it's not like we just hide and we, 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 you know, insulate ourselves from the world. But we need to be aware that there is something that is being taught all the time, and it is anti-truth, meaning it's lies. <laughs> listen to what the Scripture says. 1 Corinthians 3, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. The wisdom of the world is folly with God. Colossians 2, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Paul is saying to the Colossians that you can be taken captive by a philosophy. It can captivate you and thus control you. So be careful is what he's saying. James, again, come on Friday. James chapter 1, religion is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. If you have to keep your un yourself unstained from the world, it probably means the world's staining you. <laughs> it means the world's going to stain you. So you have to have a concerted effort to not be stained from the world. We must guard truth like it's life or death because it is. Brother and sister, we are not at peacetime. We're at war. This is wartime mentality. And, and that is what Paul is trying to say to Timothy. He's saying to him, own the gospel, bear the gospel, preach the gospel, guard the gospel. And that might come in any order just like the bop it game. You never know what order you're going to be asked to do it in. Sometimes I just need to preach the gospel. Sometimes I need to, to, to be clear that I'm owning it. Sometimes I need to be clear that I'm guarding it. And it, it's the preparedness that we need to think about. And this is what Paul's desire is for Timothy. He wants him to be prepared. And finally, Paul doesn't admonish Timothy to do anything that he hasn't already done. And I love that. So, he, he says to, 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 to Timothy, don't be ashamed. And then in verse 12, he says, I'm not ashamed. He says to Timothy, share in suffering. And then in verse 12, he says, I suffer. He says to Timothy to follow the pattern of sound teaching. And in verse 11, we see that he's preaching. He says to Timothy to guard this deposit that's been given to you. And in verse 12, he says that he knows that God is able to to guard this deposit given to him. He's not telling Timothy to do anything that he hasn't done and isn't doing. And I love that about Paul. He's not just speaking. He's not just sharing truth. He's modeling it. He's modeling truth. And look at the… Finally, verse 12 is a pretty amazing verse. So look at it with me one more time in closing. He says, I am not, but I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me.
It's like Paul's anthem in life. He knows who he has believed, and he knows he's able. And that's true for us. So as we think about owning the gospel and bearing the gospel and preaching the gospel and guarding the gospel, we can be convinced that he is able, not that I'm able, but that he is able to do that. One day, those four commands, three of them will pretty much be no more for us. One day, I don't need to suffer for the gospel because suffering will be no more. I don't really need to preach the gospel, herald it to an unbelieving world because the end of all things will have come and preaching will be no more. I won't need to guard the gospel because the king, the king will be here to take care of that himself. But always and forever, we will be a people who own the gospel. Let's be a church that owns the gospel together in these ways. And let's not be afraid to talk to each other about it and to encourage and challenge each other about that. Because that's what Paul's doing to Timothy. And that's what I need you to do for me. So let's own the gospel together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these reminders of Paul to Timothy, the sweet relationship they have that we get to glean from by your spirit today. We want to be this people. Help us to know that, be convinced that Jesus is able to do this in us, God. We trust you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.